Uh, I now call Norman Lamb, who is our Member of Parliament to no for North Norfolk, to come forward and propose the motion as a whole. Norman. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Conference. And uh, I wanted to start, incidentally, by thanking the expert panel, which we established in accordance with a previous motion that we passed in conference. We managed to get the very best people to look at this subject, including one serving chief constable from, uh, fr fr from Durham uh, and another retired chief constable. They have produced, uh, fellow Liberal Democrats, a genuinely groundbreaking report, and we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. As they say in their report, they hope that others will follow, but I'm very proud of the fact that we are leading the way. Let me also thank uh, Rosie Schimmel, uh, our very own Rosie Schimmel, who provided brilliant secretariat support uh, for the expert panel. And can I also thank Lee Darg for his amendment, which I am happy to confirm that we accept. And I finally also express my appreciation to the Federal Conference Committee for allowing us a bit more time for the uh, report to be published uh, prior to this uh, conference. Liberal Democrats, it is long overdue that we call time on the most discredited, the most stupid, the most dangerous so-called war on drugs launched 45 years ago by that most discredited of US presidents, Richard Nixon. And I want this party to lead the way to a new approach which is based on evidence, which is liberal and which protects public health. Let me put my cards on the table. As a father, I'm instinctively hostile to drugs, both legal and illegal. Tobacco kills about 100,000 people in our country every year. Alcohol causes untold damage to so many families around our country, including domestic violence and violence on our streets. And the most potent strains of cannabis do carry health risks. There is a link to psychosis, to memory loss. But do we really think that we best protect people by leaving the supply of cannabis in the hands of organized crime? No criminal is interested in your welfare. You have no idea what you're buying. So-called skunk is widely available on the criminal market. Any idea that we can protect people by keeping it illegal is fanciful. So a policy intended to protect people actually achieves precisely the opposite. And not only that, we put billions of pounds straight into the pockets of organized crime every year. What a spectacularly stupid policy. Now, some people raise the legitimate anxiety about people moving from cannabis to harder, more dangerous drugs. But that risk, of course, is far higher when you're buying from a criminal who has a direct interest in persuading you to do just that. And on top of that, we criminalize tens of thousands of people every year for the use of cannabis, blighting their careers, damaging their life chances, and restricting their ability to travel. And we know that many people with mental ill health resort to cannabis as a relief from the pain of life. And then we criminalize them. What a cruel and unjust policy that is. And then there's the real hypocrisy. Whilst all those people are knocked back by criminal conviction, others, usually the most privileged, go on to build successful careers. How many members of this Conservative government have smoked cannabis whilst maintaining their support for the conviction of other fellow citizens? 
David Cameron was a reformer, and he was a user at Eton, nearly got expelled for it, uh, and at Oxford. In 2002, as a member of the Home Affairs Select Committee, he and others called on the then Labour government to initiate a discussion of alternative ways, including the possibility of legalisation and regulation to tackle the global drugs dilemma. So why have you changed your mind, Prime Minister? Why do you continue to allow your fellow citizens to be put at risk and end up with a criminal conviction for doing exactly what you did? That is gross hypocrisy. Now, when we debated this recently in Parliament, I was joined by one Labour backbencher, Paul Flynn, who's been a consistent supporter, one Green, Caroline Flint, Caroline Lucas, Caroline Lucas, <laughs> not Caroline Flint, and one Tory, Peter Lilly. What strange company. But the two front benches, Labour and Conservative, resorted to the same tired, discredited arguments against change. This report, rational, wise and balanced, points to a very different approach. The framework they propose is based on the primary goal of protecting and enhancing public health and community safety, of focusing particularly on the health and well-being of vulnerable and marginalised groups. It is guided by evidence. It's deliberately cautious and requires regular reviews. It proposes a new cannabis regulatory authority. Producers and products and sales would be licensed. There would be a minimum age of 18 for purchase and consumption. Controls on potency, particularly a minimum of 4% for something called CBD, which is important in reducing the risk of dependence, of psychosis and of memory loss. So much safer than what is available on the criminal market and it would raise up to one billion pounds in tax and saving vast amounts of police time so that they can concentrate on violent crime. An approach taken by Brian Paddock way back in 2001. Let's now get that at mainstream across the whole country. <laughs> Liberal Democrats, we are all committed to the fight back. If we are to succeed, though, we have to stand for something. We have to articulate clear liberal values. We have to convince that broad mass of people in our country who are liberal in their instincts, in their values, that we are the party that represents them. It is by taking a clear, principled, evidence-based and liberal stand on issues like this that we can start to persuade people to support us again. Back this motion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Norman. Could James Blanchard from York, Jens Daly granley also from York, and Emily Tester from Arran please attend the speaker's table? Would Howell Davis from Carmarthenshire and Pembrokeshire please stand by? And I now call Lee Darg from South West Birmingham to propose um, Amendment 1. Good morning, conference. I suppose the easiest thing to say is what Norman said. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I've been incredibly privileged to call Norman a friend uh, and to work alongside him in government and continually now on the mental health agenda. During the election campaign last year, some of you may remember, I've chosen to remember we had an election last year, um, one of my opponents in a husting said, oh Lee, you're always going on about mental health. At which point I quickly snapped, I nor my party will never apologize for starting the conversation in government on mental health and carrying it on, so please do. <clears throat> And also, please remember with Norman, Nor Norman has an interesting feature that the more praise you give him, the more modest he gets. <laughs> so please remember to continually praise the work that he's doing, and, and along with Brian, as mentioned. I, I took two points from the fracking, uh, fracking motion just been. The first of all, that it's not dangerous if you don't inhale. I don't know if that applies to cannabis. But also that sometimes populism is good uh, if you're at 6% in the opinion polls, which I understand the argument for there. For this motion, however, as Norman clearly pointed out, the law doesn't work. And let's be honest, social attitudes towards drugs are very much stuck in the 70s. 
uh, for Norman to be able to have a go at Richard Nixon in a current debate, I thought was, was quite clever and well done. So we, we've got to be partly responsible for helping improve and change social attitudes towards many things in our society, one of which is drugs. The amendment itself specifically calls uh, to flesh out two areas, the first of all, uh, which is on young people's mental health specifically. We have to recognise the wealth of psychological evidence that says that those people who excessively use cannabis in mid to late teens can have problems with memory formation and retention in their later years. However, this motion goes to try and attempt to battle that by having safer supply, and I've known so many people who take drugs who believe because they are friends with their dealer that they'll never get bad stuff. It's something they believe, and it's not often true. But also, by having more education, which is the other part of the amendment uh, which, which has been accepted, that education has to come in schools as well, as FE and HE, prisons, detention centres, we support as a party PHSE to be mandatory because we accept the reality that 14-year-olds are having sex, so we would rather them do it safely. We also accept that 14-year-olds and older are doing drugs, so we would rather them do it more safely if they choose to do it and if they don't get support to come off. So please do support the motion, please do vote for it, and vitally, along with mental health, go out and campaign for it because there's something really important to change social attitudes. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee. Would Juliet McAfee from Islington please stand by? And I now ask Howell Davis from Carmarthenshire and Pembrokeshire um, to come and speak for the motion as a whole. Is Howell here? He is, great. Smashing, thank you very much. In June 2011, I had a seizure which knocked out the entire me of my right hand side. Um, it was mostly due because I was unable to take my HIV medication at the time. Now, when I was admitted to University College Hospital London, um, we discovered that out of the three tumours in my brain, one of them was lymphoma. That means it was the cancer of the lymph, lymph node cycle. Now, I went through four cycles of chemotherapy, um, and actually, I was quite good. You know, I'd walk to the supermarket next door and get decent food to eat which no one else in that war did. Uh, yeah, don't worry, it's not with applause. Uh, uh, on, on, um, on my third chemo cycle, I started to be a bit sick, mainly be by, it was over the Christmas period, and people uh, out, you know, temporary doctors were prescribing all sorts of ridiculous stuff. And I remember one day after having been particularly violent on my hospital bed, which I called the cage, um, the, a lovely nurse came in, and I'd known him for quite a while. He was the head nurse on the ward. And he said, how will, we are amazed by how you are coping with this. You are on the highest dose of methotrexate. There is a guy in a similar situation as you down the corridor. He can't keep anything down. He can't keep his oral medication, any food, even water. I said, we can't quite understand why. Well, I have a very big suspicion why. It's because I had cannabinoids in my system. Now, there's a whole host of anecdotal research, basically, uh, uh, sorry, anecdotal evidence of the fact that cannabis has a very profound effect on cancer. And there's an awful lot of rubbish written as well. And the problem is, is you can't do proper uh, studies and tests of the benefits of cannabis for cancer for anything because it's prohibited. You know, all we have is anecdotal evidence. Someone will say online, and say, oh, it cures cancer. Well, we don't know that. We can't do that until it's studied. And we can't do proper studies, clinical studies of the effects of cannabis and how it works until it is legalized. Thank you very much. And that was Howell's first speech at a federal conference. Congratulations.
Would Ian McGrath from Bromley Borough in Kent please stand by? And I now call Juliet McAfeela from Islington to speak against the motion. Thank you so much. I'm excited, first of all, to um, speak against this motion because um, I feel that uh, we are all here and 70% of you perhaps um, support um, uh, this motion and um, I feel I want to bring a different side of um, uh, this um, uh, debate. I strongly say no to this because internationally, Kenya policy is uh, saying that it has killed many youths internationally. In Meru, for instance, it has destroyed a whole village. And so I grew up seeing cannabis uh, being sold at 10 shillings in Kenya in certain communities. So I thought, if I saw this destroying the communities of United Kingdom, obviously, I am going to get worried. And for that reason, I decided today to say, I want to bring a different perspective and bring about the ideas of how the, the views of these youth people in those villages. I want to say no, and I'm looking for your support to vote against uh, this motion strongly because um, I sincerely believe that it has destroyed a nation in Kenya, and we are feeling the after effects of, um, uh, of cannabis in different areas in, um, in Kenya and around Mombasa. Most of the people grow this, um, they grow this um, cannabis because they want to export it to Britain. And if Britain decides to say yes, what we are having is people uh, trafficking drugs. And I don't want to see people trafficking drugs across internationally because they want to get it to Britain. I don't want to see that. I want to see Britain supporting and saying, actually, we support international communities to fight a, a traffic laws. And, uh, and we don't want to uh, make, sh we want to make sure that um, this president of Kenya and other presidents in the African Union are actually supported in fighting cannabis and the effects that it bring. I strongly ask you to support the motion and support these presidents in their fight against drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Juliet. Could I ask Jens Darley granley and Emily Tester to please go to the speaker's table? Would you and Hoyle from Glasgow South please stand by? And I now call Dr Ian McGrath from Bromley Borough in Kent, who wishes to speak for the motion, particularly lines 32 to 34 and 46 to 47. Chair, we in this room uh, know we have to thank Norman Lamb in government for drawing attention to the need for investment in mental services and in specialist therapies in particular. My father was a psychiatrist in the even more Cinderella field of mental handicap. Now we have to hope that with Norman as their conscience, the Tories will follow through. A few years ago, I related to conference the sad history of my younger son, Alistair, as a third child, he suffered from comparison with his older brother and sister. And having been exposed to cannabis behind the bicycle sheds at school, his amiable, easygoing character led to his beginning to fail academically. As he drifted towards his GCSEs, his teachers could not understand why his parents seemed not to share their concerns. But their messages to us had been entrusted to Alistair's own hands. He scraped two GCSE passes in a school where seven or eight were clearly achievable, though his musical talents remained impressive. He failed to benefit from crammers and drifted into jobs in security while deluding himself that he was running a business organizing disc jockeys. He had shown features of a schizoaffective disorder with paranoia and episodes of violence and was diverted into private psychiatry 
when he could have been landed in, in prison. One might speculate how much more rapid his decline might have been in a university of crime and drug scenario. We regularly had to pay off his debts, and shortly before his 39th birthday, some drugs cartel had him flown out to St. Lucia to act as a mule. The condom-wrapped package evidently burst in his stomach and delivered a lethal punch, probably of cocaine, from which he was dead within hours. I myself had a narrow escape from dependence on alcohol at one stage and could easily be persuaded that there might be a hereditary liability to addiction. I would like to think that a more enlightened attitude to some aspects of what could be termed lifestyles would lead to a happier, more cohesive society. It took me some time to adapt to the fact that my older son was a homosexual, but he and his long-standing partner were in a stable relationship, and my wife and I and some close friends and our daughter and her three children recently joined them when they celebrated, Mark, Alan and Mark celebrated their marriage. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Conference, shortly we're going to move to interventions. Um, could I ask the following people, please, to go over and queue up by the interventions microphone just to my right, um, to the left-hand side of the auditorium. Andrew Hudson from Barrow in Furness. Martha Vickers from Newbury. George Miles from Hereford. Jeff Reed from Bradford. Peter Costa Vadakis from Kensington and Chelsea. Brian Stokes from York. Uh, Jack Davis from New Forest. James Blanchard from York. Would Elizabeth Adams from Stratford-upon-Avon please stand by? I now ask Ewan Hoyle from Glasgow South, to, who wishes to speak for the motion at lines 48 to 49. Uh, hello again, conference. Um, can I first, firstly, I uh, thank Ian for sharing its story, his story. Uh, it puts this motion in its proper context. Um, five years ago, I, I climbed onto the conference stage to propose the motion uh, protecting individuals and communities from drug harms. Um, it was a tentative motion, asking for certain things to be investigated. Um, and I've been delighted with the fact that these investigations have led to us adopting a policy to decriminalise drug possession for personal use before the election last year. And I'm delighted that we are having today's debate so we can take the first steps towards an appropriately regulated drug market. Um, I was concerned, however, about Clause C, though. Uh, clear limits on the strength of cannabis products being commercially available. And I was concerned because I thought that it might leave stronger strains that people might want to smoke to be sold by criminals in the illegal market. I am now satisfied, having read the, the panel's recommendations, that the cannabis social clubs can cater for those people who wish to smoke strong, short, stronger strains um, without them needing to resort to purchase from criminal dealers. Um, it is the strongest drugs with the greatest potential for harm that it is essential that we take from the criminal market to be regulated and sold with the best available health advice. The health risks are hotly debated, but if there is any debate about the potential for high THC cannabis to cause psychosis, then the best way to regulate the drug is to ensure there is advice provided about the early warning signs of psychosis to those who use the drug, and especially to those using the stronger strains. We can't afford to pat ourselves on the head and say well done after passing this motion though. Cannabis doesn't kill. Um, I want you to ask what drugs are best left to the criminal market rather than careful regulation by the state. Ecstasy pills are killing people because they don't know the concentration of MDMA that is in it or because the active ingredient has been replaced by a more readily available but more toxic alternative. How long do we wait to stop these deaths in young people who are seeking a more profound connection with their peers? seeking an enjoyable night out and instead leaving their families distraught. Five years ago, I tore into our politicians for their cowardice. The sad truth is that they have only grown a rudimentary floppy spine. We need to stand tall, reconvene the expert panel and ask them to come back with recommendations for how to regulate all the drugs that the people of Great Britain use. from caffeine on one end to crack at the other. Only then will we be truly leading this debate internationally. In closing, I want to take us back to the motion we passed five years ago. There was a third major and forgotten call, 
a call for heroin-assisted treatment clinics to be rolled out nationwide so that addicts didn't need to commit crime or sell sex to fund their habit, and so they could be engaged in services and kept safe. Despite our great strides forward on mental health for this population, so often scarred by unspeakable trauma, we have largely, like the rest of society, turned our backs. Enjoy remarks to a close, please. Yes. Since the year 2000, the drug-related death rate in Scotland has more than doubled. We need to see safe injection rooms and heroin-assisted treatment much, clinics Ewan. in all our major Thank cities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan. Corpus, after the next speech, we're going to move to the uh, interventions. Um, in the meantime, I call Elizabeth Adams from Stratford-upon-Avon, who wishes to speak for the motion uh, as a whole. Our first intervener after this will be Andrew Hudson. Thank you. Conference, five years ago, my first conference speech was a pleasure to be in favour of the motion that we had um, from the previous speaker uh, about a sensible evidence-based drugs policy. This issue for me is one of the key reasons why I'm a Liberal Democrat. This motion is only being talked about by our party, this issue. Now, for me personally, my story was that I was a victim of domestic violence. A lot of that violence was exacerbated by the use of alcohol and, in particular, cannabis. Now, because alcohol is legal, we were able to bring that up. Um, support was offered by way of alcohol support programmes. Cannabis was never mentioned because it's illegal, and that would have caused even further problems. I grew up on one of the most deprived council estates in the country, and I also did a stint working as a pharmacy dispensing assistant in a pharmacy in that council estate. And I can tell you, drug usage is pandemic. In the most vulnerable and poorest societies, it's everywhere. It's a reality. Now, if people are ha having social issues exacerbated by drug use and they cannot feel that they can seek help and support anywhere for this because they will be penalised and criminalised, this is wrong and it cannot be allowed to continue. <laughs> what I learnt from my uh, months working in pharmacy is that actually Every substance that we consume, whether it's for medical reasons or not, carries a risk. Some people will be affected by side effects. Now, I would much rather people knew about the risks, they were educated about signs to look out for, and they knew when to seek help, and now they felt comfortable to get that help. That is what we need to do. Now, I am fed up of hearing the phrase, war on drugs because it's not a war on drugs. Drugs are doing very nicely, thank you. It is a war on drug victims. That is what has been happening for decades. So I'm sure you're all well aware of the economic reasons, the social reasons, the health reasons, the education reasons, and the liberal reasons to support this motion. So once we've supported it, we need to go out there and we need to make our case to the public and do not be afraid for social backlash because this is the change that this country needs and it needs it now. Please support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Right, conference, we're now going to move on to interventions. The first speaker after the interventions um, will be Richard Church from Montgomeryshire, so could he please stand by? Would Jens Darley Granley please go to the intervention microphone as well? You'll be our last intervener. Uh, our first intervener is Andrew Hudson from Barrow and Finesse. What isn't clear from the motion is what action is going to be taken regarding cannabis factories. Periodically, cannabis factories are uncovered, often when there's been heavy snowfalls. Teenagers and children larger from Vietnam are being trafficked into the UK to work in cannabis uh, factories. As statistics show that it's the most prevalent form of child trafficking. It is literally slavery, forced labour. 
Cannabis smuggling involves organised crime, including drugs cartels. The motion makes no reference to either the, these cannabis factories or the cartels. The, cartels. Now, now, the cannabis factories need to be closed down, and any regulation regarding the use of, of cannabis should require that it's ethically produced. So I uh, ask the, the movers of the motion, to, to, uh, in their summing up, to explain what they'll do about the cannabis factories. Thank you, Andrew. Martha Vickers from Newbury, please. In my past work in the NHS and in volunteering, I've seen many lives destroyed by drug abuse. Vulnerable people, sometimes supported to give up their habit in prison, but then return to society, blighted with a criminal record and with little support to maintain a healthy lifestyle. What we are doing just isn't working. Those who make money from peddling drugs are flourishing. The number of users is increasing. And evidence from work done in other countries is pointing to a better way. The Liberal Democrats, once more, are speaking up bravely on a controversial issue. These proposals to bring drug policy under public health are evidence-based and will save people's lives. Please support this motion. Thank you. George Miles from Hereford, please. Uh, the Green Party support legalised cannabis with 6% and three MEPs. Um, I've had a couple of friends die of heroin, more friends die of alcohol, which is a really dangerous drug. But what I'm against is, number one, the fixed penalty for possession of drugs it means that if a poor person is going to a rave with an E, they're going to get a fixed penalty, 50 quid, which will bankrupt them for weeks, whereas a city trader can take loads of crack, pay the 50 quid fixed penalty and go and mess up the economy, you know, they were gambling away with money on coke, and that's why there was a crash. They, they get arrogant, cocaine, <laughs> oh, we know oh, all that money, and then there was that big crash, and they could just pay it out as petty change. So I'm against the fixed penalty. Thank you very much. And legalise. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff Reed from City of Bradford, please. <coughs> Dutch coffee shops, cannabis clubs, fine, no problem. Not really relevant to our ward in Eccleshill, Bradford where we're one of Yorkshire's top burglary hotspots. We come top out of 30 wards in the city for antisocial behaviour, some of it fuelled by alcohol and other drugs. There is something rather pathetic about people stealing metal grates from the gutters and lawnmowers from garden sheds to feed their habits. Pathetic, yes, but blighting the lives of low-income local residents. By all means, begin to reduce harm under the public health banner but say it also as necessary intervention and regulation of a huge, huge market to keep us safer on our streets and in our modest back gardens. So let's pass this relatively modest motion and go from there. Thank you. Peter Costa Vadakis from Kensington and Chelsea is our next intervener. Thank you. Uh, my brother, two and a half years ago, died of MS. The only pain relief he could have was illegally bought cannabis. That's why I think this motion is, would address that, that sort of feeling that he had and stop people who are in pain becoming criminals. But my question to Norman Lamb is this. Why stop at cannabis? Why not legalise the whole shebang under the framework of this motion and we'll have no more dead drug mules? Thank you. Thank you. Brian Stokes from York, please. Hi, guys. Um, as you may see, we don't appear on Question Time much these days. We rarely get called by John Burko in PMQs. We have to basically create our own publicity. And one thing that was magical this week is that we've actually had a lot of headlines and a lot of good publicity about this policy. If the Lib Dem fight back is a thing that's actually going to happen, what we need is really radical, socially liberal policies that people like. Most people in this country are socially liberal, we need to stand up for the values that they have, and the only way we can, and if we don't, and we need, and if the fight back is on the word, we need really radical social liberal policies, starting with this, and we can go on all day about what else we can do as well. <laughs> Basically, radical liberalism, hell yeah. Thank you. Jack Davis from the New Forest is our next intervener. Thank you. Um, I, well, there are quite a few reasons to back the motion and the amendment. I'm going to quickly focus just on a little bit about the economy. Um, I believe it will provide funds that we can use to create a just society as well as removing the false economy of the war on drugs. 
which only costs our overburdened NHS and puts money into the hands of criminal gangs. I don't want that failure of policy to continue. It is also sheer stupidity on the part of the Conservative and Labour governments to regulate tobacco and alcohol supply, but not to regulate cannabis, a similar product. Please make the difference we need to see today. Thank you. Thank you very much. James Blanchard from York, please. Thank you. I've been working with a group of medical cannabis users here in York, and they find for a variety of medical complaints, including cancers, MS, and serious mental health issues, that cannabis is the only thing that works. How dare we criminalise them? The impact of a criminal record can be absolutely devastating on many lives. You can lose your job, you can lose your housing, you can be separated from your family and your entire social network. Especially for young people, it can lead to a life which descends into further crime. Now, despite his promises to the otherwise, George Osborne is cutting £160 million from our national police forces over the next few years. As the Police and Crime Commission candidate here in York and North Yorkshire, I want to be able to say that our party will stand up and say that we do not want our officers wasting time on drugs which are not affecting anybody and can concentrate on the violent crime which is what they are truly there for. This measure will also bring in funding for treatment and that we all know that is the only realistic way of helping those who need that help but also allowing that funding for policing and other issues. Thank you. Our final intervener is Jens Stale Granley from York. Thank you. Conference, today we have to choose. Do we want to live in a society where if I want to buy cannabis, which I may do, maybe, <laughs> but do, do, do we want me to buy illegal cannabis from a sketchy drug dealer and financing Mexico drug cartels? Or do we want to live in a society where if I buy cannabis, I can buy it from regulated stores, the cannabis I get is safe, and I financing the state. We can get one billion pounds each year, and with that money we can reinvest that, uh, we can re reinvest that money to people with actually drug problems, to NHS and to nurses. So conference, I ask you today, because I'm Norwegian and the Norwegian Lib Dems don't want to legalize cannabis, so please beat them. Show the Norwegian Lib Dems that we are smarter than them and better than them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our interveners conference. Would Mahmood Henry Rogers from North Bedfordshire please stand by? And it might be best if you're standing by to come and sit in the front row to make it as quick as possible for you to get up. In the meantime, I call Richard Church from Montgomery Shows, a police commissioner candidate, to speak for the motion as a whole. Richard. Conference, I have a little quiz question for you. Which part of the country do you have to live in after Merseyside if you want to have the highest chance of being charged with possessing illegal drugs? Is it London with its wonderful and thriving diverse cultures? No. Is it Manchester with its huge student population uh, experimenting with strange substances? No, it's not there. Perhaps it's one of our other great cities where there are problems of urban deprivation may lead to drug taking. No, it's none of those places. It is where I live. It's the rolling hills and valleys of mid and west Wales, stretching from the beautiful Pembrokeshire coast to the edge of Snowdonia, a place you would rightly think of, of calm and tranquil beauty. There are more charges for drug possession per thousands of the population in the police area of David Powys, where I'm standing as the police and crime commissioner candidate, than there is in the London Met, Manchester, or anywhere else in England and Wales, apart from Liverpool. So what does that say about the people of mid Wales? Are we all on a drug-crazed crime spree terrorizing our neighborhoods? <laughs> Look at another statistic. Which police area in Britain has the lowest overall level of crime per head of population? Yes, it's David Powys. 
On all scores, from antisocial behaviour through to violent crime, we are one of the safest places in Britain. Of course, we have crime in Mid Wales. Yes, there are issues. But unless someone convinces me that smoking cannabis leads to sheep rustling, <laughs> then I won't put the issue of crime and antisocial behaviour down to the consumption of cannabis in the hills of rural Wales. I can't find a single record of cannabis possession in David Powys that has led to the loss of life. Of course, there are health risks, and we shouldn't underestimate them. But consider this. In one year, over 300 people are killed or seriously injured on the roads of David Powys. It's a shocking statistic that makes all the crime we have in our rural communities pale into insignificance. I'd rather have one more person stopped and charged for endangering the lives of others by their reckless behavior behind the wheel of a car than 100 people charged for possessing a mildly addictive drug that they intend to take for their own pleasure. <laughs> when a police force is arresting more of its citizens for drug possession than any other comparable force in the country, while more than 300 people each and every year are dying or having their lives changed forever by accidents on our roads, priorities have become very strangely warped indeed. The proposals in this motion should make a huge change to policing in this country. To draw remarks to a place Chasing people for cannabis possession doesn't save lives, it doesn't make communities safer, and it Thank doesn't stop much. people taking cannabis. Thank you Please very support much. Them. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> We're very tight on time, I'm afraid, Congress. I want to call as many people as possible. Would Anton Georgiou from Brent please stand by? And I now call Mahmoud Henry Rogers from North Bedfordshire, who wishes to speak against the motion. Hello, conference. Now, I'm not against this motion because I'm in favour of a war on drugs. Certainly not. I'm against this motion because I think our current policy is better than this. There's a lot of good stuff in this motion under conference notes and conference beliefs. It rightly notes that our current policy is against criminalising cannabis users and in favour of allowing the medical use of cannabis where doctors agree with it. However, where it goes wrong is under the conference calls for. Firstly, the age of sales. It specifies that there should be uh, uh, an age limit on the sale, but it doesn't say what it should be. And that's a rather important point. I, I understand that, the, that it's better if a 14, 15, 16, whatever age uh, child wants, uh, it's better for them to get something from the doctor than to get it from an illegal dealer. However, it would be better still, if they absolutely needed to have it for medical reasons, that they should get it from a doctor. Now, uh, under the, uh, the issue of the premises um, of uh, cannabis social uh, clubs or cannabis cafes, uh, this doesn't send out the message that cannabis is bad for you and could give you schizophrenia. This sends out the message that, it, that relax, you know, have a joint, it's all legal. If, if cannabis has to be sold, it should be from a, chemi a chemist and ideally under a doctor's prescription. Uh, packaging and marketing should be restricted. Yes, the, the motion rightly says it should be restricted, but actually it should be banned. It, uh, well, not packaging, but the marketing, <laughs> market, uh, advertising of a, a, a very unhealthy product like that should be banned, it, uh, as it is with tobacco. Taxation has failed to discourage binge drinking in Britain. Our party policy was for an alcohol minimum price, but it looks like the European Union is going to strike down what they've put in place in Scotland. So tax, taxing cannabis use won't, won't discourage it to a significant extent. Because if you tax it too much, it'll end up being sold illegally anyway. So the policy will not solve the problems of illegal trade. So in summary, our, policy, our party policy already stops um, criminalizing uh, cannabis users and uh, allows for the medical use of uh, cannabis. All this policy would do is bring in cannabis cafes, which would make uh, using it more, more fashionable. The conference vote this policy down. Thank you very much. <laughs> would Sarah Noble from Calderdale please stand by? And I now call Anton Georgiou from Brent in London, who is a GLA candidate 
and he wishes to speak for the motion as a whole. My name is Anton Georgiou and I am the GLA candidate uh, for Brenton Harrow in the upcoming London elections. I'm also the youngest candidate standing in the London elections. <laughs> I'm proud to be a Liberal Democrat because ours is the only party that has the real solutions, the real Liberal solutions, that young people in the capital desperately need. Our party is the only party to have a fully costed plan to provide the affordable housing young Londoners need. Our party is the only party committed to dealing with the long-lasting consequences of climate change and pollution in our city. And our party is the only party that could once and for all seek to end the most hypocritical and failed of social policies, the war on drugs. I'm speaking in favour of this motion because of everything that Norman Lamb, our incredible health spokesperson, outlined in his speech, but also because I fundamentally believe that if we make the right decision and vote in favour of this motion today, our party will again do what it always has. It will lead. As Liberals, we are always ahead of the times, and history has proven that we are right to be. Charles Kennedy led our party in opposing the Iraq War, and we now know how right he was. Nick Clegg led our party into government in order to deliver truly liberal policies for Britain. Tim Farron has consistently led calls for this government to do more for refugees across Europe. It's time for us to lead again. It's time for us to lead the charge for a fairer drugs policy that actually works and that doesn't simply punish individuals and reinforce stigma. Liberalism for me, and I'm sure for many of you, is about giving power back to people, allowing individuals to decide what they do in their own lives without having the state intrude and interfere. This motion calls for a fair and regulated, regulated market for cannabis that is safe and protects people. Globally, the tide is turning against the so-called war on drugs. We don't have to look far to find other states around the world who are pursuing similar policies. Justin Trudeau's Liberals put reforming Canada's drug laws at the forefront of his, of his party's election campaign, and look where they are now. I strongly urge you all to support this motion so that once again our party, the Liberal Democrats, can do what we always do, lead. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Conference after the next speech, which is from Sarah Noble, we're going to move to the summation. There's not going to be a summation on Amendment 1 because there was no opposition to it um, during the debate. Um, so will Brian Paddock please stand by? And I now call Sarah Noble from Calderdale, um, who is an exec member of LGBT plus Liberal Democrats, who wishes One to speak them. for the motion. Conference, I'm going to be serious here. The war on drugs, or as the nice lady from Birmingham said, the war on drug users, isn't just a failure, it's a racist failure. If you... T if if you take any time at all to read, the, read about the history of drug prohibition, it will tell you that. The ban on marijuana in America in the 1930s deliberately targeted Mexican people. And the further stigmatisation of drug use by Richard Nixon, by Ronald Reagan, by George W. Bush only serves to stigmatise racial minorities. Despite... African Americans, comprising 12% of the population of America and 13% of the drug using population of America, they comprise 33% of drug arrests, 62% of convictions, and 70% of incarcerations. That is clearly not a mistake. The fact an African American of my age has a one in three chance of being in prison in their life. That is a clear result of this racist war on drugs. <laughs> we are fundamentally a pro-evidence party and an anti-racist party. We cannot talk about being serious on racism when we ignore the evidence to perpetuate an anti-racist, to perpetuate a racist war. 
we must follow the evidence that it is more likely you will die from riding a horse than it is from taking ecstasy, and that it is more likely that you can win the lottery three times over than overdosing on cannabis, because you can't overdose on cannabis. We must blaze forward with a pro-evidence drugs policy, because we, the Liberal Democrats, are the only party that can do so. Thank you very much, Conference. Thank you, Sarah. If there is anybody watching this in the overflow area who would like to vote, you're going to have to come in here and do it because there are some limited spaces available in the auditorium. Uh, I now call Brian Paddock from Bermondsey and Old Southwark, who is, of course, a member of the House of Lords, um, to summate on the motion as a whole. Good afternoon, conference. If I can address some of the, uh, the comments that have already been made. Juliet and the, uh, the Kenya experience. Yes, cannabis is dangerous, which is why we want to regulate it. Um, we want to also take out drug dealing from, from the hands of, uh, of the criminals. Ewan on stronger uh, strains of cannabis. This report, uh, this expert panel report, is the basis for a legal framework. We need to look carefully at the detail. And Ewan, you also talked about ecstasy and other drugs. I gave evidence as a police commander to the, uh, ho to the Home Affairs Select Committee back in 2002, uh, where I said that it was a waste of police time for, the, for, for my officers to go into nightclubs to arrest people for cocaine and ecstasy that they had paid for by money they earned legitimately, and I don't demur from what I said then. Really important point made by Elizabeth about the fact that because cannabis is illegal, people are reluctant to come forward to get help with that. It's holding people back from seeking the help that they need. And as far as illegal uh, cannabis factories are concerned at the moment, we want to close them down. We want to take all the criminality out of, uh, uh, out of this. George, the Green Party does not go as far as this motion does, as far as regulating uh, cannabis is concerned. Mahmood, the raw problem with our current policy is it leaves uh, cannabis uh, production in the hands of criminals. Conference for over, I've got 30, over 30 years uh, experience as a police officer, and I came to the conclusion that we need to reduce the harm caused by drugs and arresting people is not the way to do it. In 2002, I posted on an internet bulletin board, help the addicts screw the dealers. When I was a police commander in, in uh, Lambeth in South London, I introduced a pilot scheme where I told my officers that they must not arrest people for possession of cannabis. And one of the reasons, Sarah, I agree with you, is because uh, my officers back then were stopping and searching young black men for possession of small amounts of cannabis, and it was racist. When I ran for Mayor of London, and what a brilliant candidate we have this time round in Caroline Pigeon, we ran a campaign uh, where we said the police are wasted on cannabis. Uh, and I'm glad to see the... Uh, I'm glad to see that the party's finally catching up with our way of thinking. And the, and the example that Richard gave about Duffy Powers is, uh, is exactly uh, uh, supporting that. This motion conference is all about reducing the harm caused by cannabis and taking drug dealing out of the hands of criminals. It's about keeping people safe, particularly our young people. So on the amendment, Lee, yes, heavy use of, cabinet, of cannabis during your mid-teens can be damaging to your health. Uh, heavy use at any time can be uh, damaging, just as heavy use of tobacco and heavy use of alcohol. That's why we're proposing age restrictions, and we do need to, mo to do more in terms of educating, particularly our young people, about the harm caused by drugs. Conference, this motion also calls for an important step of rescheduling cannabis so that it can be prescribed to those people uh, who are suffering from pain and other conditions. And that brave and moving speech by Howell surely has convinced everybody in this room that we need to do that. Conference recently, my colleague Sally Hanwy and I moved an amendment in the House of Lords calling for an objective evidence 
uh, evidence-based approach to drugs. Both the Conservatives and the Labour Party refused to uh, support that amendment. This is an evidence-based approach. As Norman Lamb said, it is rational, wise and balanced. Please support the motion as amended. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. And I thank all, all of the contributors to that debate, and my apologies to all those that I couldn't call for lack of time. Um, there was a, a certain imbalance in the cards submitted in that debate, and I reflected that in who I called. We're now going to move to a series of two votes. The first of those is on the amendment, which is at page uh, 11 of Conference Daily. We have OMOV. Anyone who's registered for conference with the word voting on their pass can vote. Could you please hold that towards me if you want to vote either way? Can I see all those, please, in favour of Amendment 1? Thank you. Can I see those against? Oh, that's clearly carried. Thank you very much. Conference, now we're going to vote on the motion as amended. Can I see all those in favour of the motion as amended? Thank you. And all those against? Thank you. That, too, is very clearly carried. Thank you very much indeed. Can I thank my aide up here, Andrew Wiseman, and in the hall, Chris Maines. Conference, thank you for all of your contributions. Have a good lunch.